Hi guys and welcome back to Birmingham Fan TV, it's sponsored by Boyle Sports. Hi guys, welcome back. Just before we get into the video, please don't forget to like this video, comment down below throughout the video all your thoughts and subscribe if you haven't already and we'll get on with it. But if you do like to hear our voices rather than see our ugly faces, then we are also available to listen to on Spotify as well as YouTube so you can have the pick whichever you prefer. I always feel so, very victimised whenever you say ugly faces because I never agree to this. <laughs> <I> never... <laughs> My mum always told me I wasn't ugly, so. <laughs> well, no. my parents said the same, but there we are. That's what parents are supposed to do, aren't they? And this week, we are finally joined by Corey, who does <laughs> a lot of work for our social media and our media marketing side of the channel. So, and it's great to have you on, Corey. Finally, for Thank everyone you. to see your lovely face. Yes, yes, <laughs> finally. Just finally, yeah. <laughs> and Corey's been working with us since March, so that's why our stuff's got a lot better since he started working with us. <laughs> so guys, let's get straight into it. Let's start with the awards which were announced at the time of filming this evening, at the time it was released last night. Um, Duke has won the Players' Player of the Season and the Supporters' Player of the Season. I know my thoughts, but do you both think this is fair? Is there anyone else you think was in with a shout other than Bellingham? Um, I don't. I don't actually. It's a difficult topic because I think you're picking the best of a bad bunch. If I, if I'm being ruthless, ruthlessly honest, and I can't speak this evening, um, it's been a pretty dire season, and I think it's pretty hard to argue against Juki. When you look at the statistics he's thrown up this season in terms of what he's done, you know. I think it was 14 goals last season and 15 goals this season. Um, and if anything, he's been playing in a worse team this season, uh, but yet managed to to hire, you know, achieve a higher total. And most of the time he's been playing up front by himself. So, yeah, I think he's one of those players that, you know, despite all the hardship, he always gives 120%. And, um, you know, it, it's kind of hard to argue against him considering how consistent he is as well you know I think sometimes what he lacks in quality he never lets us down with in in energy or in commitment and, and I think certainly for me he should have been made captain a long time ago um, and I think he'd probably feel a bit hard done by that he hasn't been made captain but I'm sure I don't know Corey do you probably agree with that or is that yeah to a certain extent um, like you said I think effort you can't fault Duke ever and um, for me personally, I'd probably say Gary Gardner. Uh, I think a lot of the time, I think he just, in midfield, he's built the engine sometimes. I think we've been really lacklustre. Uh, I think, obviously, Sunnage, uh, I think Kepp has been injured a lot. We've had pretty much no options. I'd probably say Gary Gardner for me uh, as a possible option. But like I say, Juki kept us up really with that last-minute goal uh, against Charlton. So, yeah, probably Juki for me as well. I think... You could also throw another shout in there. I think I'm thinking most of the players pre-lockdown because I don't think one player earns an ounce of credit no. uh, after lockdown. I think a lot of fans would agree with that. So we'll, we'll kind of we'll, we'll brush over those nine games. But I think Christian Pedersen, for the majority of the season, was also yeah. uh, really consistent and really, really good at the back um, and ever sort of present and reliable character for us um, and consistently in the championship teams of the week. Um, Obviously, I think coming back after lockdown, he really didn't show up, which was disappointing. But um, Peds was also, you know, a good shout as well. Um, and I think he contributed four goals this season, if I'm not mistaken, possibly, including that ridiculous <laughs> header at the start of the season, which I don't think I've ever seen a flukier win than that day nah. at Brentford. Was it 27 shots or something to Brentford? And they hit the bar like yeah. four stupid. Times. Yeah. I remember. I think, <laughs> yeah, go on. I was just saying, I've seen a lot of talk about um, people saying Pedersen's head's been turned obviously since January. He's one of the players that there was there was interest from, well, I'll say about. Um, do you think that since then, or maybe obviously since the restart, his mind's been somewhere else? Yeah. I think so. Yeah. I yeah. really think so. I think that you haven't, but then again, it's the same with all the players. I think Yeah. it's a really tough one because you could argue that his head's been turned, he's looking for a move, he doesn't want to get injured, but you could also argue that the pet leaving made so much uncertainty that the players just lost 
all train of thought and passion. Um, so I think it could swing either way. But I'd put my two pence in and say, I think Jake Clark Salter was probably one of the most sturdy players throughout the season. Yes, he was injured a lot, but when he was in the, the back, he played a lot better. And it showed his calibre compared to, no offence, Harley D. <laughs> um, <laughs> who is not necessarily the worst footballer in the world, but Jake Clark Soldier is just a level above. And with him and the team, he just looks a lot better. So in my yeah. opinion, him and Roberts would, would have been up there if they weren't so injured throughout the season. But there we are. That's a, it's a tough one. But Bella got goal of the year, which I think we'll never be able to forget that goal. And Bellingham obviously got young player of the year. Do you think they're about right? Obviously Bellingham. That's a, that's a given, but Bellingham's yeah. goal of the year? Yeah, I don't think we scored many good goals this season, thinking no. about it. I don't remember many good ones. We were, to I be think, fair, Sonny yeah. has scored a, a few good ones. Yeah, yeah, that's a fair point. I think his two goals against Cardiff and Derby were pretty good. So that's a, that's a fair shout. Um, but yeah, it's, it's kind of hard to argue. I think the technique, I think the vital sort of to put us back in front, I think that goal... Um, did it, it, I think made it two one away, and we pretty much went on to control the game after that. And yeah, I think I think it was we don't score many free kicks these days, do we, Blues? So it was nice to see a free nope. kick go in. Um, yeah, I think like you say, I think you fair shout with Pedersen, uh, not Pedersen, Sunjic with those two strikes, um, especially he's won a Derby. Right. Well, he's won against Derby at home was a bit. He still scored from it. Yeah, but we're talking goal of the season, not just goal. <laughs> I think any go- I think we we only scored four goals or something after lockdown. So I think any goal after lockdown could have been a contender. Exactly, oh, yeah. exactly. <laughs> Positive. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. No, definitely. I, d- I don't know. You agree, Cora? Yeah, it's a, it is a hard. I think there's been a few scrappy goals this season. And Too many. Yeah, yeah. I think mean, that it kind of it defines our season really. Uh, some clubs, obviously, around the world, obviously within the championship, have got. 10, 20 goals probably as a list. We probably had two or three. Um, so, yeah, it really just explains the season that we've had, I guess. Yeah. Yeah, I think I think it does. Um, like I say, it epitomises us. And I think that, yeah, we've, we've had to scrap for a lot of what we've had this season. There's been no real quality about us. There's been no real no. structure. Um, usually, you can tell what a... What to, you can tell what type of goals a team scores. Uh, you can tell the quality within a team by the goals they score. You know, certain teams score certain goals, if that makes sense. Like Brentford score lovely flowing goals with lots of quality and lots of flair and finesse. You've got teams like, I remember when Cardiff were playing under, um, when they had Warnock in, when they went up that season. They, were, they didn't, I think Warnock gets unfairly labelled as a horrible manager and he's not. They play very no. direct counter-attacking football and they also always scored very fast goals on the break they were always catching teams with powerful and pacey players and they scored lots of goals like that blues this season have been very much let's try and be physical set pieces i think we scored the joint most set pieces in the league this season 16 wasn't it james something like that yeah 16 yeah, yeah. I think we were up there with west brom and brentford or something like that yeah um, i think yeah stoke as well yeah, I don't think we scored many more apart from them, let's be honest. And, that, and that's it, yeah. and that's what Blues were synonymous with this season. I think that's why a lot of fans were a bit down, you know, and it's been, it hasn't been great to watch, let's be honest. And you, you're, I think people are okay when football's not great to watch if we're getting the results, but we weren't getting anything. So, um, yeah, I think, it, I, think, I think it was fair to say Bella's goal was shining light in this one. Definitely, James. I think one thing that I probably would mention is that I think we were one of the top clubs of conceding from set pieces as well, which I think we were one of the top scorers of, of actually scoring uh, from set pieces, but we actually also conceded them uh, quite a lot as well, which made little sense. I know it's, it's different from defence and attacking, and, but you think obviously with Pep, Pep's philosophy, a lot of it did include set piece training, and that was a lot of his job under Monk. Um, which this season just, yeah, obviously the long throw. Um, Don't we didn't talk score about that. With. So, yeah, yeah. Let, let's, let's hopefully no more long throws the rest of Birmingham City history. Uh, <laughs> yeah, I think, 
I was actually a little bit surprised to see the statistics of how bad we've actually been this season from defending set pieces. Like you say, considering we're so good at attacking them, surely, you know, that means your set piece coach and whoever's doing the set pieces is pretty good at both ends. Um, and it surely means that the physicality you've got to attack them should be pretty good with defending. But it's not. And Pep, we were so good under Pep defending set pieces under Monk, I'm pretty sure we were. Um, or at least we were much better than we were this season. Yeah. But I think I put it down mainly to, again, a lack of organisation with the team. I think a lot of the times this season, we just looked really unorganised and really chaotic. And I think it was you know, pinpointed when teams were able to, to plan a manoeuvre against us you know, from a set piece. They knew how to pick us off. They knew that it'd be pretty easy to, to score from. And you know, we none of the defenders ever looked confident. They never looked at a unit. Yeah. Um, which you is... took a positive take on it, though. Yeah. If I can try. try. Um, <laughs> you got to think, most of the season, really, we haven't had our full-strength defence there. It's yeah. always almost yeah. been like second-choice players because of injuries. So I don't think necessarily it, things would have been as bad if we had our main players in all the time. Um, but we were terrible in defence anyway when we had um, our makeshift defence. So it, it sort of adds up a little bit. But I think that's the only positive is that going into next season, OK, we've lost Jay Clark, Salter, but if we get in another decent centre-back alongside Mark Roberts, hopefully things will go a lot better. Yeah, I, I think part of the problem was obviously we defended set-pieces, corner specifically, was we were more focused on wrestling the players and actually defending the set pieces. It was kind of like, I think that, maybe that comes from the start of the season. Obviously, preparation uh, obviously was clearly poor because uh, how the season ended up being. And I think, obviously, players that Pep wanted originally didn't get signed or obviously all the alterations with transfers and the rest of it. And I think it just caused problems from the start. I mean, I think attacking and defending corners and set pieces was all to do with that. And, um, we run out. We run out of ideas pretty quick. Yeah, pretty quick. Definitely, no, definitely for sure. Um, but I think, I think most people want to want to hear about us talk about the potential incoming now. Um, so we can yeah. put next last season pretty much to bed. Um, yeah. I think it's important that the club move on pretty quickly because I think we can't dwell on it too much anymore because last season was. Had promise, never delivered, disappointing, you know, resulted in a shambolic end um, that was almost disastrous. And I think that the club needs a big overhaul, a big reboot, and the fans need to be given some hope and some confidence going into next season. So, um, should we? Yeah, let's start that confidence boost with talking about someone <laughs> that we have been very excited to talk about. Obviously, at time of filming, this hasn't been confirmed. If it does get confirmed whilst we're filming, we'll definitely keep the reactions in the video for your enjoyment. But yeah, um, <laughs> but if there's, if there's any, so I was just saying, is any any in the nose? Um, if you've got any sources or any information? Please let us know. Uh, <laughs> so we can release it urgently. <laughs> I wish I knew that. I'm very excited about it. Yeah, but, so that has been talk and it's been uh, posted on the BBC this morning of time of filming. The Eitel Karanka is set to be announced as Birmingham City's new manager. I don't think I have to say how good of it is, but how good it is of an appointment for Blues. But lads, let's go into a little bit more depth about him what we can expect from his style of play and how beneficial having a strong manager would be for the club. Yeah, no, definitely. Like I say, if you didn't already go and watch last week's episode, um, last week's podcast, um, I spoke to, to, um, to borrow a breakdown um, about ITOR, everything that ITOR was about at Middlesbrough. Um, he gave us a, a big lowdown and it's fair to say it was a pretty glistening report, to be honest. Um, Obviously, everybody, every manager has their downfalls, and that's well, uh, well documented with Eitel, with um, the fallings out that he he's had previously with um, Middlesbrough, uh, and obviously Nottingham Forest. I think not; it's not well documented, sort of the ins and outs. And I think he's been a little bit hard done by with some of the reports. Um, Middlesbrough, there was things going on behind the scenes again, and obviously he plays his part in both of them, but. Um, 
It's not exactly like he throws a paddy over the smallest of things. Um, but the board do need to be careful the way they operate around ITOR, um for next season. But yeah, getting into it, um, obviously, if you want to go and watch that one at, at Borough Breakdown, please go and watch it. It was a really, really good talk. Um, I'm sure you'll enjoy it. But yeah, w Richard Wilford this morning um, saying that uh, Blues are set to announce Itor Cranker as the, the new manager in the coming week, um, which was a complete U-turn from what we'd heard the night previous. Uh, various sources were saying that the deal was dead um, and it had gone very quiet. There'd been no talk all week of what had been going on and people were starting to get a little bit, uh, a little bit jittery um, after, I think it had been well over a week since the, 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 the sort of the last sort of update and yeah, fans were understandably jittery, but yeah, Richard's saying this morning, so it's done. And, and, and I'm, I'm delighted to be honest. I don't think I can express my delight. I think anybody that's followed me on social media knows that I put <laughs> and me and me and Corey spoke about it, that the, the day that Pep was sacked, I was confident that the board would chase after Karanka again. Um, yeah. I know what they want and I know the, the pedigree that they were after. Um, and and they've tried before, so you know if he's available and he's willing to talk, of course they're going to go and chase him again. And I think Don will be absolutely delighted to land his man third time. Third time's a charm, really. Um, you happy with this one, um, or Corey, or or are you? Was you, did you have your heart set on someone else? Uh, well, obviously you were the first person we spoke about this ten weeks ago, and uh, before Pep was obviously resigned or sacked. Uh, and you was the first person actually to mention Ita to me. Uh, at the time, I think you, if you remember, I was a bit 50 50. Yeah. Um, I think, and then looking, now doing a bit of research and looking into Ita, I think what we've got on our hands is a different perspective. We have got a manager who's not a chancer, uh, which might be a bit disrespectful to the other managers we've had, but uh, we need him more than he needs us. Uh, I think that's a different perspective to what we've had to read before. Um, every other manager we've kind of they've needed us uh, but in this situation we were we're really in demand for him uh, which is nice to know um, that he's interested to take any job uh, and for me one way I've seen the, the negotiations of, of the um, contracts and obviously all the transfer agreements is that he he set on what he wants and he's, he set a, a guide on what he believes is doable for the club uh, and what he feels he needs to obviously get in promotion uh, is what I can imagine. Yeah, def no, definitely. I think that that's massively important, like you say. Um, we've appointed managers in the past where I think we probably, they they were clambering through the door to get in yeah. at, the, at the hot Definitely. seat. I think Cottrell's probably the prime example. Yeah. Monk, I guess, had a point to prove. I think Monk was probably the best choice we made outside of Rowett. Um, I wasn't overly keen on Monk, but it, it ended up being okay. You were at the time. At the time, you were quite a big fan. Yeah. Looking back, I think. Is, anything over Steve Cottrell, though, let's be honest, at the time. <laughs> yeah, that's true. Um, yeah, that, that scarred me a little bit, that. Yeah, it was, it was a painful time, which we don't talk about. But like you say, Corey, it's, it, you're right, you know, in saying that, um, you know, he's outlined his, his, his kind of what he wants and, and the you know, he, he's not going to just say yes, he's not a yes man. I think that term keeps getting banned in yeah. round all the time at the minute. He's not a yes man and he's certainly not that, you know, he ain't going to, he's not going to stand for nonsense. He's not going to stand for meddling behind the scenes and I don't, I don't think the board will, will take that chance anymore. I don't think they can. I think they have to get it right this time. They've waited and waited and waited to get their right man. Um, and I think that they've kind of held back on funding the club last season to try and probably pump it in this season to the right guy. Um, they simply have to, we have to see progress. Um, and I think Itor can, can certainly bring that in, you know, his track record speaks for itself. Um, what he went in and did at Burham Forest. Yeah, definitely. Guys, one quick question. I want to know what you think about how, not so negative, how much time do we give Karanka? Obviously, Research shows that he's on average he's at two so two years at a club. Um, what time frame? What time frame do you think the club be working with, and what do you think we should expect? Uh, any, anything to happen within a time frame? I think it's going to be a, a couple of years at least. I mean, the club's okay. in a, a terrible state at the moment. I mean, yeah. it's just the squad's not 
strong enough at all. I mean, as in, we haven't got enough players for a strong squad for yeah. a start. So we've got to do a lot of recruitment. And then he's going to want to try and get in players that fit his style. So whether it's we just get what we can for, for a while, give him the time with what he's got, and then let him grow. I think you're going to have, for me, I'd give him three, four seasons to, okay. to get the, to the next level. Obviously, you can do it a lot sooner. But I think if you look at clubs like Brentford, where they've had the same philosophy for a long time, they're a stable yeah. club. Look at them now, and it's taken them seven, eight years, I think it is. So, you know, give managers time to implement their style of play, implement their philosophy. I'm sure Cranker and the board get on very well, so they'll have the same vision. And I think that if they work with each other rather than working apart, they can actually do this in sooner time. But I think we should give him an extended period of time because of the issues that we've been going through the last six seasons. I mean, how many managers we've we been through? Is it six and six or six and five? I think this is, five? Five. I think five this is the fifth. Years. Yeah, that's it, right? Yeah, yeah. exactly. Years. So we've been through way too many managers. The club is completely unstable. It's just a ridiculous situation in the sense that we haven't been able to get the club going in a sense. So we haven't been able to put in a plan and keep going with that plan because we have to keep changing personnel which is all well and good if they're making mistakes. But the unfortunate thing with Pep was is that he had a really terrible squad, let's be honest, looking back on it. Yeah, on so bad, was balance, up, wasn't it? Exactly. He was just set up to fail, really. And that's no one else's fault. Like, that's not the board's fault. That's not the club's fault. It's just what they had and what they could afford at the time because of all the FFP and everything going on. So... Going forward, I think give Craig three or four seasons. If he hasn't got us promoted by then or pushing by then, I think that's when you need to look at it. But yeah. it's unrealistic for a sustainable business or club for anything before then to really kick us on. Because I think if we only give him a, a season or two and we get promoted and he doesn't do so well in the Prem and we come back down, give him that time and to get us back yeah. up sort of thing, rather than just sack someone because... They've made it. Like like what Norwich are doing. I hope they yeah. don't sack him after we say this. But yeah, yeah. Like, um, <laughs> with Farker, like, he got them up. They've gone back down. But he will get them back up again, hopefully, yeah. for them. Um, because I don't want to go to them again the season afterwards. So hopefully <laughs> they go back up again. But you, you know what I mean? It's just yeah. it's stability. And that's something that I'm really keen on as a fan. Yeah. And as a business person. <laughs> Oh, sorry, sorry, James. Emily, obviously, you spoke about FFP. James, this is what we spoke about before. But was this season a standing? Was it a trial season? Was it a season where we avoid FFP, where we we brought players on that were youthful, no experience? Was it just to get them a season in until we found the right man? What do you think, James? Yeah, definitely. Yeah, we we've oh god, we've badgered over this so many times. Yeah, <laughs> um, yeah I think it's pretty clear to see that. There's a clear there's a clear plan in terms of recruitment now. Um, let's get young players in who we can develop and sell on for a profit. I think it's a sustainable model. You look at Brentford, they do it. Norwich are beginning to do it. You know, they're going to sell Max Ahrens and, and Jamal Lewis who, you know, cost some peanuts and they're going to sell for multi-millions and they'll do the same. I think Zemi Buendia as well. Yeah. Um, you know, uh, Blues now... Yeah, I think this season... Looking back on it as a whole, we didn't spend a huge amount of money. You know, we can look at Sunjic and say, yeah, but he was over it. By the looks of it, he is being paid in instalments and nothing big. Crowley was less than a million pound. Um, we didn't really spend much money on anybody else. And anybody that did come in, like Jimenez and Vialba, they've gone already and we've made a profit on them. So, yeah, I think this season was a stand-in. Let's balance the books. It was very much used a lot of the money from Adams to make sure FFP is very balanced and we're back in the good books of the EFL, so to speak, uh, not to, to start any more fires, it's just think, extinguish the ones we've got and go again when we can get the right man. I think Pep was brought in as a chance. He was very much a risk. Yeah, He was someone that they believed in and I think that they believed that he had potential. Certainly, I don't think they would, they would have appointed him if they didn't think that. But... Yeah. Um, I also think, like like it's been well documented, Pep didn't particularly want the job. Um, he wasn't. Um, I guess he isn't cut out ready, or he just doesn't want to be a manager first team. Um, so it was very much, a, can you come in and do us a job for a season and help us out until we can get the right man? And I think, I think if you look back last year, I don't. I think 
they probably would have wanted Karanka last year, but they've put off yeah. for a season because I don't think they could have given him the budget last summer. And I don't think he operates if he doesn't have a decent budget. And I don't think circumstances were right for Karanka to come in last year. I think he lost his dad or yeah. something you know, close to that. Or um, I might be wrong, but I'm pretty sure it was some family circumstances. So I think he was a stand-in until he could get, they could get the man that they wanted in. Um, and like I say, third time's a charm, really, pulling Karanka in, because they've tried. They've, I think they had him in the bag last time, and things fell through, and then it failed second time when they tried to get him. So, yeah, I think um, it's all about you know building now and, and trying to be steady and, and not try and rush this. Really try and improve the structure of the club and improve the, the stability. And, and, and obviously, eventually, stability rewards you with success. You know, with success. And I think that let's, let's have a clear structure and a plan and, and, and really execute it as best we can. Well, talking of stability and bringing people in, players, what players do you think we should bring in? I know James has a few players already that he's <laughs> mentioned to us. But yeah, Corey, have you got any players that you'd personally like to bring in that you think would fit his style? Players, players specifically, maybe not yet. Uh, I think positions definitely. I think goalkeeper. Um, like we spoke about earlier, I think the Spanish Revolution we tried uh, didn't work a lot down to the goalkeeper. Uh, obviously, we looked at different clubs like Man City, Liverpool. Obviously, unrealistic. We're not a Man City, Liverpool, but. They all identified a goalkeeper was an important part of playing the passing at passes in the back, which with camp was clearly impossible from the start. Um, so I think a goal, I think a goalkeeper, I think a goalkeeper probably is one in midfield, uh, but players specifically not yet. Blues, Blues have been desperate for a proper goalkeeper for the last yeah. Season. I'd say Thomas Kujat was the last good goalkeeper Blues had. And he wasn't phenomenal, but you know, Tommy Kay was pretty good. Well, at uh, least Blues... he's still not got a team. I don't uh, think he's even retired. Uh, he's just not playing. I think, uh, I'd probably say he's retired unofficially. <laughs> yeah, probably. Yeah. But, Which is a shame. Yeah. yeah, Kujat was a good goalkeeper and was unfairly bombed out the team, in my opinion. Um, Blues, yeah, like Corey says, we have to build from the back. You know, Blues prioritise the wrong areas sometimes and they need to understand that to... To build a successful team, Blue Suns only have to look at some of the most successful teams in our recent history. Um, McLeish is the, the obvious one. I know fans are going to go, but McLeish played some really boring football. He did and he didn't. But we also won a lot of things under McLeish. You know, in his three full seasons with the club, we got one promotion from the championship, the best defensive record, one um, ninth place finish in the Premier League and one cup win. Uh, and obviously, I know we went down, but I think injuries contributed to that and various other things. But And he prioritised building a solid back line, solid back five, should we say, goalkeeper and back four, and then built on top of that and added quality in the, the attacking areas. And I think it's exactly what Karanka will do. He will come in, make us hard to beat, structure that defence, because I'm, I'm looking at some of the players that we've got. Obviously, Camp's gone now by the looks of it. Um, I don't think we're going to give him that that contract um, he's got no goalkeeper and he'll look at some of that back four and he'll laugh and he'll say there is absolutely no chance I'm working with some of these um, they're not good enough some of them I think can yeah. work under him you know under the right manager I think they can I certainly think Roberts is someone that shows potential and I think we could still see him in the blue shirt next season um, but as for some of the others um, I think Pedersen might be off for money Dean I don't he's almost burnt his bridges with fans hasn't he now very much so yeah yes, right. um, and Colin I worry about his physicality I think he likes a strong back four and Colin certainly gets bullied in terms of defensively physic you know great going forward but physically he isn't fantastic so yeah he's got he's got some work cut out with that back line I think he'd have kept Clark Salter if we could but I don't think we'll be able to afford him personally um, and I know that one of the players I want. I don't think he'd want to come back. Let's be honest. No, I don't. <laughs> yeah, no. I think it was it was a bit interesting that he didn't play the last three games. Was it due to an injury? Yeah. I, I I think he probably didn't want to play anymore. To to be honest, I don't have any inside knowledge, but I just that was the vibe I got. Um, yeah, you can't blame him for that though. It was so toxic the last few yeah. games that yeah. it was. It's not going to be good for his progression, for his career. So you can sort of understand, but. But one, one name that floats around 
obviously I've mentioned to you about a million times right now. Oh, here we go. <laughs> Daniel Ayala. <Daniel Lyle. laughs> but why not? Why not? Captain Middlesbrough, when they went up, uh, or I think he was, no, assistant captain, uh, vice captain to Grant Ledbetter. But I think he's captain Middlesbrough for quite a few years. Karanka absolutely loves him. He loves Karanka. Ayala is one of the best centre-backs you'll get in the championship. Uh, and he's on a free transfer, so he's not going to cost you anything. His wages might be reasonable, shall we say. Um, but maybe he'll take a slight cut to go with the Blues budget if he really wants to work with Karanka. I don't think Blues will be too fussy. I, don't, I think as long no. as he's not on like monumental money, which I don't think he will be on something astronomical. I think Blues will pay him a higher-end wage to get him in um, because they know that they need players. And Karanka will say, look, you know, I love working with Ayala and I know what he's going to bring to the team. I've worked with him before. The club will go, no problem. That's probably one of the things that's been discussed. You know, I want my players in. And if I want a player, can we bring him in? No problem. Because that's how you make a manager work. He knows the players he needs. Um, and I think another one that I mentioned was, was Adam Clayton as well. He was also on a free transfer because Blues should utilise this free and loan market as best they can to, to make sure that they save the money that they've got to buy real magic bits of quality you know if we want to bulk the squad out in certain areas there's plenty of good frees out there before we start spending the money and Ryan Shotton I think he's on a free contract yeah as well. That. yeah good, yeah. good option and um, I think the one problem we have got is that I think this transfer window will be a bit of a domino effect I think you'll have to have players to move on from different clubs obviously with obviously with the pandemic and the rest of it a lot of people spoke within the industry and um, within the sport industry specifically that a lot of the clubs will be swapping players. Uh, that not much cash will be actually transferred. Yeah. A lot will be player swaps, uh, loan deals. So I think it's a bit of a dominant effect. We have to see who moves where before we can get who we want. I think we saw it in January with some of the obviously signs we were linked with. Um, the, the, obviously the one that we didn't happen was obviously that Emil Smith Rowe, the Arsenal youngster, the midfielder. I think we believe chose Huddersfield. Uh, over Blues and obviously at the time January that didn't seem like a good choice um, mm. towards the end of the season I guess it wasn't too bad um, but like I say I, we haven't got the pull um, and this is where money will talk I think we'll have one of the biggest budgets yeah. out of all the other clubs um, which I think will surprise a lot of the other clubs um, I think the points deductions potentially to Wednesday and I think Derby might still have a case. Um, yeah. Yeah, both. Might both them financially as well. So. Both will definitely be docked points. <coughs> both yeah. both will be in trouble. Uh, and the fact that they've escaped it this season, they've been incredibly lucky, but they will be hit by a points deduction, both of them, next season. And it wouldn't surprise me if, if they see transfer bans. I think Derby have been bringing through a lot of young players in anticipation of a transfer ban. Um, yes. To try yeah. and bed those in as quickly as possible because they know they're not going to have anybody else to sign. So... Um, I think that kind of takes them out of the race. But I think a big transfer budget can also work to your disadvantage because a lot of clubs ramp the price up because they know you've got some money. You know, they're going to say, well, why would we sell you um, this centre-back for £2 million when we know you've just pulled in £26 million for Jude Bellingham and maybe, I don't know, £8 million if we sell Pedersen, for example. Why would we sell you this guy for £2 million when we could easily get 3 or £4 million from you, you know? And but that's good. when the, they need to be strong, don't they? And just say, look, if you don't, yeah. if you don't want our money, we'll go elsewhere and find someone else. And that that board are going to have to be strong. It happened yeah. in January, obviously, with uh, Mbappé here. Um, that happened there. Obviously, demand too much money. Um, and they pretty much just, well, I'm not on so sure, but obviously a lot of discussion was that Blue ended up looking at other targets. I think we looked at um, another Wolves under 23 player, which also rejected us. Um, I think back to the players, Emily, I think one's popped around Adam Armstrong at Blackburn. Oh god! Yeah. It was a pretty, re- it was a pretty decent season. Um, I, I mean, he's ex Newcastle youth player. Um, yes. yeah. very, very good, very good season this season. Um, about 23, 24 maybe. Um, yeah. I don't imagine Blackburn will be demanding too much. Uh, it's just whether we could get a player. Whether really? he thinks Blues will f- finish higher than Blackburn. Uh, I, I don't think we'd. I, I'll be honest. I don't think we'd be able to afford him. I think he's a phenomenal yeah. player. I think yeah. didn't Blackburn pay like five, six million for him only 18 months ago. If I'm not mistaken, they paid a lot of money for him. I think they'd want to. Oh, okay. No, I'm just thinking like 
Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's what, what, I think, what, they, what they're going to demand. Yeah, yeah. I, I, think he'd, I think he'd be a great signing for any team in this league. I think he's, I think yeah. he's hit close to 15 goals this season um, or something close to that. He's been very good. I think he won their player of the season. Yeah. Um, he's a, Talking he's a, of goals, but yeah. sorry to cut you off. Talking right. of goals, <laughs> there's a player that we do need to talk about, a little bit of an elephant in the room, is what's going to happen with Scott Hogan? Oh, yeah, I, don't, I haven't seen though. much discussion about it at all. And technically, now he's not a Blues player, he's back at Villa. So, are we going to yes. go in for him? You know, we won't have him next season if we don't purchase him. So, or should we go for someone else? Because he was great up until lockdown. Yeah. But I don't want to judge him after a lockdown because everyone was terrible after lockdown. So, yeah, I think that's the key to take away from it. It's evident. It, didn't we talk about this? I think it was earlier today, actually, that strikers are... The biggest myth about a striker is it's a confidence thing. You know, Scott Hogan comes in, and I know that you could say, well, he came in and he wasn't confident when he came to Blues. Yeah, but I think we gave him some confidence as well. Yeah. You know, he came in and he hit seven goals in eight games before lockdown. Um, he was it was me. Fire. Yes. It was my birthday. Well, yeah, yeah, he must have been. <laughs> Uh, first game, it. first goal on my birthday. It was me. <laughs> what well, lucky charm? I was absolutely. <laughs> I was trolled that game. I think we had free drinks in the in the box for that game, and I was absolutely <laughs> plastered. But um, no, I um, I think I think he's going to be judged a little bit harshly because a lot of people will remember his performances after lockdown. Um, and yeah. it, and he's not a bad striker. Scott Hogan is a very good striker. My worry is not whether the club will want him or not, because I think the club would actually be happy to pay three million for him and get him under a good manager because let's be honest nobody played well in the last few games so to say he's crap just based on those games is is hard um i don't think karanka wants him is your issue um yeah karanka is synonymous with he wants pretty much the best number nine he can get his hands on in this league he took lewis graben to uh nottingham forest he had jordan rhodes at uh, Middlesbrough he had David Nugent when obviously David Nugent was one of the best he dropped down for the Premier League um, who else did he have there he had Christian Stuani he had multiple... it hurts me that David Nugent was ever good Patrick Bamford <laughs> I think he had as well he wants the best number nine and I can see that trend following here I can see him trying to pull in one of the best he can pull in in, the, in this division to score the goals because it's and in that case game. what does that mean for Lukas Jovic hmm yeah, it's a bit of a concern yeah. that, he, that today he could be in what player this season in a week's time he could be shipped out. Um, that would be harsh. That would be so yeah, harsh. Yeah, uh, it's a hard one because really he's, he's one of the only players who's probably followed the club's identity in one way. Mm -hmm. uh, I guess he's probably one of the players that the fans can relate to. Um, yeah, he's a very good PR man, isn't he? Really? Yeah, yeah. I mean, I mean he's been part. I think mean, he's been part of the PR plan for the last few years. Um, there, hasn't been many, there hasn't been many players to pick from, if we're yeah. honest. Um, so yeah, it's a, it's a hard one, isn't it? It's I, I don't I think in a sad, in, in a sad way uh, we need to get rid of him one way because we rely on too much. Uh, yeah, so I think that we need that with Djokovic is that if we don't get rid of him, we we we'll always have a plan B. We, we always let's do a long throw. Let's 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 just hump up to Djokovic, and I think it's about removing that, uh, it's taking a risk. Have we, have we got someone big enough and better, better to fill his boots? That's, that's what it's all about, isn't it? Yeah, mm -hmm. I, think, I think he's a leader as well. I think he's great around the, the, the training ground. I think he's a real role model for Blues. And I think he's become a real court hero. To shift him out is going to be really difficult. You know, he, he shifted him out when he was at Middlesbrough. He didn't want him at Middlesbrough. Um, but he wasn't really a court hero there. He wasn't really a fan favourite. Uh, so it's quite easy to get rid of him. I don't think he'll have the same joy this time. And I don't think the board will want to get rid of him either. I think that might have been something that's also been discussed. You know, Juki can't go. We can't get rid of him. Yeah. I agree with what you're saying, though. We do overutilise him when he's in the team. All we do is hit those root ones, those diagonals. And, yeah. and I feel for him as well, because I'm sure he would rather not have that all the time. Uh, but the players rely too much on him as an outfall. Um, we need to... Either Kranka needs to utilise him better when we're out there, try not to do that all the time, or you don't have him at all. Um, I think that'll be for the manager to, to decide when he comes in. Um, but I can't see him not starting the season 
with a, at least one or two mobile strikers, to be honest, players that yeah. can run in behind that can that can really cause problems with their pace and power. Because you know, if you look, like I say, you look at the strikers: Bamford, Graben, uh, Stuani, um, all of those players that he's had. Jordan Rhodes. They're quick, they're powerful, they're pacey, and they're clinical finishers. And he yeah. does not mess around because you're only as good as your forwards. Steve Bruce said years ago when he was at Blues, you're only as good as your forwards. So he's going to demand that we spend in those areas to to obviously be ruthless when we do get the chances. Yeah, I think it's a double-edged sword really, isn't it? You, If you get rid of him after the fans vote him as the player of the season, you've already alienated the fans. So you yeah. don't want to do that. But like you both said, we, he's been carrying the weight of the club on his shoulders for basically the past season, trying yeah. to get those goals. And he's effectively kept us up by scoring that goal against Charlton. Give the guy a break. You know, let's get, we, let's not just have one striker. Even if he's our second or third choice striker, keep him in the club because yeah. he gives so much to the club in other ways than just on the pitch, yeah. which I think is really important, especially with the stability because he's 31. So he may not have um, a huge amount of playing time left. He may have four years left in him. If he stays at the club, did almost what Paul Robinson does. If he wants to go into coaching or, you know, go behind the scenes and do, I don't imagine he would, but if he did want to do a certain role like that, then keep him at blues because he'd be great with the youngsters. No, definitely. I think, should we just wrap up quickly with sort of talking about Karanka's sort of record and what fans can, can expect when, when he does come in? Um, like I said last week with, with Borough Breakdown, um, he gets a ridiculously unfair sort of uh, label of horrible negative football. Um, I think boring, it can, I guess it can be um, if you're not going out and winning every game 4-0. Some fans do find it, and that's the, the game we're in these days. But, you know, I look back at some of his records. I think when he got Borough to the playoffs in his first full season, because he had a half season, then he had his full season, I think he beat, they'd beat Ipswich 4-1 at home. And Ipswich were a playoff team. Who got playoffs that season? Uh, they beat Brentford 4-0 at home as well. They beat Norwich 3 or 4-0 at home as well. They went and beat teams by three and four goals. They scored 68 goals in that season. And I think back to McLeish's season with Blues when he got was promoted, we only scored like 53. So he's scoring 15, 16, 17 more goals in this season. Um, and he, then he, the, you know, we had a McLeish and, and we dealt with McLeish's football. And it, yeah, it got a bit boring sometimes, but it was effective. Cranky gets his horrible, like I say, tag where he's negative. And he's actually just a structured manager. He knows how to organise his teams. They don't concede many goals. And when they do get the chances... You know, they're absolutely ruthless. I think, you know, that's one, one sort of um, label that you should be labelled is, is that when they, some games, they might only create two or three chances, I, I was told, but they take those two or three chances. Some games they create like 20, 25 um, chances and, and they still might take one or two. So, yeah, I think you say that's fair, Corey, or... Yeah, I think I think it's part of that tag of Jose. Obviously, looking to read, I actually didn't know he was actually Jose's assistant at Madrid. Um, it's the same there. Uh, obviously, this week I think Tottenham did get Europa League um, qualification, and people are saying Jose's boring. He hasn't got it anymore. Um, it's similar to that. That Jose is defensive. He isn't going to play like Man City. He isn't going to try and beat team six 0 He's going to try and park a force and score one goal and win the game. Um, I think that's kind of what Crank is kind of getting uh, by the sounds of that. It's defensive, but he gets results. Um, I don't think it's Poulis. I think there's a spectrum. Yeah. Uh, I think we're not we're not going towards Poulis. I think Crank is in the middle uh, of kind of Thomas Frank Brantford, where we're passing the ball around quite slick. Uh, I think Crank is in the middle. I think mm. I think Blues would prefer that. I think Blues can justify um, a more defensive style of football if it's effective. Yeah, it's not yeah. it's not five ten men on the ball like sometimes the see last season where we had seven eight defenders yeah. and we were defending for twenty minutes. Um, <laughs> yeah. I, you know, Fulham. Fulham. Yeah, Fulham. Yeah, Fulham. Yeah. I'll, I'll tell you what his football reminds me of, and you might back me up here. Whenever I've watched him and what his statistics back up is, he is a more possession based uh, version of Gary Rowett. So. Gary Rowett knows how to organise his teams defensively. There's no doubt about that. They're always very good. But 
looking at Karanka's statistics, you know, under Rowett, we'd have like maybe 35%. I think we averaged like 38%, which is really quite low. Um, Karanka's possession is average in like 50, 51, 52, 53. So they, they do control games quite well a lot of the time. They have the ball. They look comfortable is what uh, I was told by the Borough podcast. They do control games. Um, but they just don't, they don't throw 10 men at the ball. They put four, they tack with the attacking midfield three, the striker, the full backs get forward and they overlap. And that's exactly what you want. And then your midfield two who sit in deeper and your two defenders, they sit as a blocker four and, and are really compact and solid. And I'm so happy with that because it's been ages since Blues have had proper overlapping full backs. I'm looking forward to, to getting that again. Um, and I'm looking forward to... You haven't to... shut up about overlapping yeah. fullbacks, let's be honest. <laughs> you look at, you look Why at are our Collins? fullbacks not overlapping? <laughs> oh, Pedersen drives me insane when he just stands on the halfway line. He does oh, my head gosh. in with that. But, you know, you, you've got to appreciate a manager that can, can set his team up because look at the, you know, the dross we've had where managers haven't been able to set the teams up since Rowett, I'd say. Um, it would be nice to get some structured football back in that fans can appreciate. Maybe it might not be pretty at times, but we might win the game 1-0 or 2-1 or whatnot. Um, and I think fans would take that at the minute over being beaten 3-1 at home or 3-0 every single week at home. You know, yeah. Anything's better than what we've had. I didn't mind the 5-4 against Leeds. I wasn't, I wasn't overly kicked in the nuts about that one. Conceding three at home for seven out of the last eight games or something stupid like that, that was... <laughs> That was taking the piss, that was. Um, and anybody moaning about defensive football needs to just remember that where we've just, what we've just been served up. So, To finish us off then, boys, before we get into the next segment of the show, let's talk about Eitel's record with his two previous clubs and his record in the Championship. And let's talk about what type of system he plays. I think, Corey, do you want to touch on the system quickly that he goes... Yes, obviously, it's, I think from what we can see that it's a 4 2 3 1. And obviously, with regards to what we've got now, it's not too far away from what we've been playing. And I think obviously, we've got Crack. The, the one problem we've got with the formation that he wants to play is does Bella come into that three in midfield? Yeah. And does, yeah. he work, does he work in there? He's been one of our best players this season. I'd, it'd be a shame to freeze him out. Um, because of the formation, I think he could fit into there. I think he's got the ability to play closer to obviously to the striker and in the middle. Um, but like I said, I think it's quite, I, that's the main part of the appointment was is that what we've got at the moment isn't too far from what he wants to play as a formation. Yeah. No, no, I, I, I'd agree. Do you know what? It might also be a controversial point, but I actually think we'll get we'll see another gear to Bella, playing him further mm-hmm. forward, closer to the striker, less defence. Not that he, he, he will be doing defensive responsibilities, but I think given more freedom in the final yeah. to express himself, I think we're going to see a player taken to the next level because I think Bella's got the attributes to be a 10-goal, 10 10-assist 10 winger in this league. Um, I really do. And I think he'll play probably on the left-hand side of the attacking midfield three. But I do think he needs depth there. I think he needs players on the right-hand side. I think he needs two, two wingers for the right. Maybe another player that will float in for the left. He needs another number 10. He certainly needs plenty of options in that attacking midfield three to, to give him options off the bench, to give him options if we get injuries, for example. He needs plenty of forward firepower, really, because obviously, like what we touched earlier, he sets his defence up to be you know, strong and hard to beat and his teams are structured. So they need that quality to be able to unlock teams when given the freedom to go and attack. Um, there's plenty of good players out there. We just, uh, we, ju- we just need to, to make sure that we, we, we're stocked in those areas. Um, but uh, yeah, like you say about Crowley, um, I think he could play a big part next season. Whether his physicality again causes any issues, because obviously he's not the most physical, but I do think he's a very tenacious player. Um, I'd like to see him given the chance because I think he'll shine in that ten. I really do. Definitely, I think I think with Crowley, I think the problem is I think his experience. Yeah. And I hate to mention it, but the infamous Jack Grealish, she's he's very good at winning fouls. And I think the problem with Crowley is he's a bit inexperienced. Sometimes he gets a bit angry, a bit hot headed uh, when he doesn't get decisions. But I don't think he make he make he doesn't make the referee's decision easy. 
He doesn't. He doesn't. He doesn't go. He doesn't keep the ball and try and get fouled. Uh, I'm a bit naive sometimes. Um, yeah. I think developing a bit more speed. I think again. I think with Juki Adams, we saw it with after James beat the work, but being less na- a bit being less naive and having a bit of experience, we try and win the ball. I think that's what we need to see with Crowley is making sure that he's able to win fouls and, 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 and try and really break up that play from the attacking point of view. Yeah, no, no, absolutely. Um, I think it'd be interesting to to see who stays, who fits the jigsaws. I think there's lots of pieces of the jigsaw missing that we're going to need to to go and find. Um, we certainly don't have the firepower um, to unlock the areas. But I'm, I was just looking at his record um, just to finish this up. I think I did the maths the other day, and um, dangerous. dangerous, I know for me. Um, <laughs> he has a win percentage at. Middlesbrough, so I'll talk about Middlesbrough first, of 46%, I believe, in Middlesbrough as an entirety. That including his spell in the Premier League. I worked out the maths on his championship stint alone. So taking away the 20, 27 games, I think he played or he managed them in the Premier League. Uh, and his win percentage worked out to roughly 52%, I believe. I don't know many managers with a 52% win ratio across two and a half seasons. I really don't. Um, I think our best manager since we've been down has been Chris Hutton. He had, a, I think, 41 or 42% win ratio at Blues. And we had a really good season that season. Um, I think, like, like I say, you can say what you want about his football, but his win ratio speaks for itself. You know, um, Just looking here, I'll read off a few of the, the numbers or the figures, say. So he played, this is including, including his Premier League stint. He had 171 games at Middlesbrough. He won 80 games. Uh, he drew 42 and he lost 49 games. But 49 of those, obviously the, the defeats 49 includes, I think it was like 13 in the Premier League. So wow. you've That's probably, an amazing record really, yeah. isn't it? Oh, it's a fantastic record. And, you know, like I said, in his two full seasons at Middlesbrough, I think they scored like 131 goals across two seasons in the full seasons. I'm not taking into account his half a season and they only conceded something like 68 so a massive plus in the goal difference as well um his nottingham forest record isn't as impressive but there's obviously factors behind that he's only got a 30.8 win ratio which isn't anything to scream about i think it's probably closer to gary monks what he had at blues um but you have to remember he took over in a turbulent time when he took over in the January of the season before, he was working with someone else's team. Uh, I think that's where the majority of his losses came from um, with Nottingham Forest. He's in, in, in his spell at Forest, he played 50, well, managed 52 games, won 16, drew 19 and lost 17. So they seemed to draw quite a few games. I think he was trying to be very resolute and, and defensive. But I think if you look at um, his, his quickly his record, when... Uh, he had his full season and when he brought his own players in it was very impressive I think he only lost five games up until the the January where he did leave so from the the summer to the January you know I think it was five defeats anyway I will work it out just a quick just a quick point Jack I think actually Emily I think see I think with Karank I think he's guaranteed it's a top 10 finish Uh, I think the 15-20% win ratio compared to the manager we've had before uh He's going to put us up to, the, up to that playoffs rather than 10 position. Um, like I said, the relegation positions and the playoff positions were about 20, 25 points this season. Um, and that, that's where Cranker's win rush, that's where it better gets you. I imagine a finish between 12th and probably rather than the playoffs. Uh, and that's what we want. That's the ambition, isn't it? Yeah. Yeah, I think it's not necessarily get promoted straight away. I think with him coming in, like we mentioned earlier about stability, it needs to really be, we need to be pushing for at least top half next season to make any progress on, we've been stuck around that 20th place mark really, let's be honest, for the last couple of seasons and Karanka would be the perfect person to come in and just boost us even that tiny bit to get us to a place where we've got solid ground where we can improve on and just go from there. So I think him with the win ratios that he's had at his previous clubs and the drawing as well compared to the losses I think if you look at if you isolate the wins and draws into one and look how many he lost compared to the other 
he actually didn't lose that many, in, apart from at Forest. But I, if you look at them as a whole, his loss percentage is a lot less than the other two. So I think that's something that's, that's going to definitely benefit us because a lot of our games in the last season, especially, we were playing really to try and win rather than to try, try and draw. And then that put us on the back foot and we ended up losing. So that's something that he's obviously going to overturn and hopefully make us more resolute and yeah. stronger going forward from the back. So, yeah, I completely we were, agree. I think definitely. he's going to be great. We were running before we could walk. I think yeah. is the best way we could put it. We were trying too hard to go and batter teams when we really needed just to be strong, resolute, and then catch teams when when we knew we could. We weren't doing that. And like I say, yeah, so as I was saying, between sort of his, his record at Nottingham Forest, um, once he'd got his team in, you know, it's hard to judge a manager when he comes in in the January. Between the, the summer transfer window and the January 1st where he was, or he left or he sacked, I think he left um, is the official story. Uh, he left just after they beat uh, Leeds 4-2 at home um, he'd only lost five games that season between the obviously the summer and then he'd only lost three games between December and the summer wow. which was a really good record they actually won nine games lost five I think they drew like seven or eight so it was a few maybe a few too many draws for his liking but yeah. still nine wins you know when you think Blues only amounted to 12 wins this whole season and he had nine wins by January the 1st and he had them in seventh place when they obviously they left, and I think there's a reason between why he left. I think he had the goalpost changed by the owners at Forest, and I think you know various things went wrong. Um, but his record speaks for itself, like we've said before. Um, yeah. and we know what we're going to get. Nobody's expecting promotion this season, but certainly, team, we're expecting um, you know, an improvement on sort of the dross we've had over the last three or four seasons, and hopefully, a little bit of you know, excitement back into the club. Okay, guys, so that just about wraps up. Thank you so much for watching, guys. It's been another long episode, but a lot to talk about. There'll be plenty to talk about, I'm sure. Next week, um, when I'm sure I talk Ranka will be officially the new Birmingham City manager. But Corey, thanks so much for joining us. Emily, unfortunately, has had to, to zip off <laughs> no. um, from that one. Um, obviously, we live a, a little bit of a busy life, so she's had to, <laughs> to pop off from that one. Couldn't, uh, couldn't even wait to end this one with us, but... Oh. Uh, tell me about it if you are listening on on youtube don't forget to drop us a like and a comment and let us know your thoughts are you happy with your managerial appointment are you happy uh, with how the club have gone about this and, and the, dir the direction that it looks like we're going in at the minute that will be uh, great to hear from you guys as always if you are listening on spotify drop us a rating and a comment as well just to try and help us out over there if you're not already following us on socials don't forget to go and follow us there with twitter facebook instagram whatever you want we are on there um, just to obviously keep you up to date with everything that's going on. But thanks so much for listening, guys, and we'll be back again next week for another episode of the BFTV podcast.